Welcome to MarcusG.TV. I'm Chef Marcus Giuliano. I'm a chef on a mission. Today's mission is how to create a well-stocked bar. Very, um, how to create the best bar uh, at your restaurant. So what does it take to have the best stocked bar? Uh, because people always say, man, and people have told me this for years. They go, Marcus, you have an incredible bar. You have an awesome bar. I've had customers say, you know, what's top shelf at, uh, at other bars is like <laughs> on your way, way, way bottom shelf. And it's not because my top shelf stuff is expensive. It's just because I have such better, small, independent, really produced brands than the big guys. So if I've got a big brand like Johnny Walker, Johnny Walker's always been on my way bottom shelf. I don't want to show off Johnny Walker. I have other things that are much better than Johnny Walker. In fact, I don't even have Johnny Walker anymore. So let's start with the basics of a Make sure you have an interesting wine list. It doesn't need to be a large wine list, but it just needs to be interesting. Of course, you have to have Chardonnay, and you have to have Cabernet, and you have to have Merlot and Pinot Noir. Those, those are the basics, and a lot of people expect the basics. They just want to go in and say, hey, I want a glass of Chardonnay. But for a lot of wine drinkers, Chardonnay is the last thing they want to drink, or Pinot Noir or Cabernet. They want something interesting, and there's lots of interesting wines out there. My first suggestion is, don't go with the big vendors in your state. Now, some states are controlled by the state, so you can only buy through the state. But a lot of states have have private vendors. So in these states, you know, there's usually one or two, maybe four big guys. They're the guys who have all the liquor and, and the big brand to avoid the guys who have all the big stuff. So as a general rule, uh, the two big companies here in New York, I buy from them, but only if I buy from them, only if I've been on the vineyard, at the vineyard myself, and I know what's going on in the vineyard, and if they have a local wine, because sometimes they might, you know, have great distribution on a local wine, and uh, all 50 states make wine, so there's no reason not to have a local wine on your list. I look for small vendors, Maybe they have themes like all Spanish wines or all Portuguese wines or all South American wines. Or they might be strong in Italian wines. And these small importers, they have small little tiny books, maybe three, four, five pages, 15 pages as opposed to 200 pages from the big guys. So in these small books is where you have like all these really cool, interesting things and a lot of phenomenal values. If you want to make money, you look at Spain or Portugal, even South America. There's a lot of tremendous value wine com wines coming out of these regions that that you can make money on. So a lot of these wine companies are actually the importer, which means you're going to save even more money. But here's the main thing. When I walk into a restaurant, I don't want to see Yellowtail. I don't want to see Mandavi. I don't want to see the big names because I can go to the liquor store, the wine shop down the road, and see all that stuff floor stacked. So as a restaurateur, you have to say, how can I not compete with what's going on down the road? If you're selling Yellowtail at seven, eight bucks a glass, and the store down the street or in your neighborhood or in your city has a big Yellowtail poster, you know, for $5.99 a bottle, you can't compete with that. People are going to think you're ripping them off. But if you find some awesome Portuguese wine that's not going to be found at any other store because it's a small distribution and you're paying, you know, five bucks a bottle, you can sell that for eight dollars a glass because nobody knows it and people are going to, the wine has to be good though, you have to back it up with good wine. You just can't say, oh, I'm going to buy cheap wine and make a big profit on it. It has to be really good wine. Then you can sell it for more because it's called blind pricing. Nobody else can really see what you're buying or compare it to something else. So that sounds easy, but it's not as easy as it sounds. So what I do is I go to a ton of wine tastings. So I travel, I live an hour and a half north of New York City. I travel constantly to New York City. I spend a lot of money traveling, uh, tolls, uh, if I spend the night at a hotel, uh, dinner, and just traveling back and forth to the city, getting in and out of the city, just to have lunch and parking and tolls, you know, can easily run $100, easily. So that I have to incur in my cost of finding the wine, because it's not like a vendor showed up and... 
had to actually go work and spend money. So I kind of factor that into the cost of my wine. So at these tastings, I find a ton of small producers, small importers, small distribution companies, and a lot of times the vineyard owner or the winemaker is actually there pouring. So I can have a direct conversation with people from the vineyard and learn all about the wine. And that's where I find my very, very best wines for my wine list, my most profitable, my most consistent, my best quality wines, and my most interesting wines. You can literally, I can literally go to a tasting on, on just Spanish wines or just wines from just uh, specific regions. Another important element to the bar is your beer selections. And again, like wine, you don't need a lot. You just need some interesting selections. I know people, you know, I know there's a ton of bud drinkers out there and Coors and Millers and all that stuff. Personally, I don't stock any of that stuff. Part of my whole philosophy at my bar is I don't stock anything that's publicly traded, any big conglomerates, so you won't find anything that Bud owns. Bud owns Left, Bud owns Grolsch, they own Boddington's, they own Goose Island, they own Rolling Rock, um, they own basically Corona, 49% not controlling, they're trying to buy the rest of it, um, they own distribution rights to Corona. Um, I don't have any Heineken products. Um, Heineken has an agreement with Brooklyn Brewery, so I don't have any Brooklyn Brewery products that I bought since that agreement. You know, when you, when you give a company like an $8 million cash infiltration for distribution agreement, you're basically a partner with them. So, you know, when a company does that to a smaller brewery, you know, they're in bed with them basically. There's so many interesting breweries out there. There's so many interesting local breweries, breweries in Europe that are doing awesome, awesome, awesome beers that we don't need to rely upon. See, back in the 1800s, early 1800s, there were 2,000 breweries in America. By 1980, there were only 40 breweries left because they had all downsized, closed, bought up, um, been gobbled up. And now, there's are back to over 2,000 breweries again. So we have all these choices. If you want a light lager, there's a choice for a light lager. If you want a heavy stout, porter, whatever you want, these beautiful IPAs, all that stuff exists. It's all out there. And every state has it, whether it's produced locally or they have a distributor that, that, that's distributing it. So my philosophy is, man, we don't need Budweiser. It's about educating the guests at this point. And that's like it is with wine and spirits. Educate your guests. It's essential to have a good tap beer program, but you know, bottles and cans, you know, cans are the big thing. People love canned beer, and a lot of breweries are doing it, so you know, if you don't have the biggest tap selection, you can get an awesome selection of bottles and cans. And with different sizes, you don't have to just do a standard 12 ounce. You can do a, a 22 ounce bomber bottle, you can do a 25.4 corked bottle. Those are make awesome presentations, but you have a little nicer of a restaurant. Uh, those are awesome, awesome beers. You can have vintage beers. I mean, the options of the beers just goes on and on and on. Personally, I go a little overboard with beer, so I have 50 different, like 49 different styles of beer on my menu. 49 different styles of beer. I have 250 beers, but 49 different styles. Who would have thought that there's 49 different styles of beer, right? We're all used to just lagers and ales and porters. Oh no, it goes way beyond that. Way beyond, lambic, sours, um, Kolsch. Spirits. So when people say, Marcus, you have an awesome bar, they're usually referring because I have good wine and good beer, but what they can visually see on my bar is all of the spirits that we stock. Almost 400 spirits. And like I said earlier, Johnny Walker, when I used to have it, was on the bottom shelf. Grand Meunier, when I used to have it, was on the bottom shelf. Cointreau on the bottom shelf because there's so much better stuff out there. My general rule is if I open up a magazine and I see a full page ad by a liquor company, a beer company, a wine company, if they got money to buy ads like that, they don't need my business. Not about making a, a artisanally produced product anymore. So a lot of states have distilleries now. New York State all of a sudden the last 10 years have, has blossomed with distilleries. They passed a new law and it's just, it's gangbusters right now. In New York, I have tons of local options for gin, for bourbon, for vodkas. I have vodkas from five local counties. So here's how I started my bar progression. 
years ago, I said I was turned on to, because I deal with small distributors, I was turned on to some really high end, not expensive, but really super boutique, you know, like when Hangar One was like really it. And before, you know, they had a, a, a new, a new, uh, a new agreement with with uh, their how they their distribution. Hangar One was like, wow, this awesome stuff that was available from a small distributor, and um, this is going back ten years, um, and a lot of other vodkas too. I was like, wow, I was like on the forefront of all this craft distilling stuff. I had the option to bring it in. So I used to have like Hangar One and several other small independent brands like that next to Absolute and Grey Goose and Kettle One and Belvedere. What's, what was happening was, people were, would say, oh, Hangar One is nice, but I don't want to experiment. I just want to go right for the Grey Goose because I know what it is. I want to go right for the Absolute. And a lot of the people would admit, well, I know Grey Goose isn't the best, but I know what I'm getting. So I was so frustrated because at the time I had like 40 vodkas. I was overboard on vodkas. And I was like, wow, I got all these great vodkas, and I'm not selling them. So what do I do? So what I simply did was I took away all imported vodka. I said, that's it. No more big brand vodka, no more imported vodka. So no more Belvedere, no more Grey Goose, no more Kettle One, uh, no more Ciroc, no, no more of any of that. Now it's a matter of me reprogramming my guests when they walk in, I want Grey Goose, uh, I have something that's better than Grey Goose. So I would like Grey Goose. I'm sorry, we don't stock Grey Goose, absolutely, we don't stock any of the big brands, or we don't stock any of the imported brands because we are, we've made a, a stance here to be patriotic and support all independent American vodkas. And once you tell your guests the right things, they're like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense, that's awesome. Let's start tasting vodka. So that's like it with all of my spirits. I look for the small brands, I look for the independents, and whether it's in my local communities being produced in New York State, or whether it's in France or Italy, I look for these small independent brands where there's a family behind the product, not a corporation, and not these big ads. I tell people, you don't deserve to pay for these multi-million dollar ads. When you drink Absolute, that's what you're paying for. It's just ridiculous to even think that they're putting all that money into the ad, and why aren't they putting the money into the product? When you deal with the small distilleries, they don't place ads. They put money in their products. They put money in their community. They put money in creating jobs. When you buy from a conglomerate like Johnny Walker, I've mentioned them several times, they're owned by Diageo. Johnny Walker doesn't have a plant anymore. When Diageo bought them, took them over, they shut their plant down. They shut their production facility down. Diageo and Johnny Walker are no longer into supporting communities. They're into supporting the stock market, their stock specifically. They're into supporting investors, getting investors, and making Wall Street happy. When you make Wall Street happy, it's hard to make a small community happy. Same thing with Boddington's. Uh, when InBev bought Boddington's, they closed the plant down. They do that with Rolling Rock, Rolling Rock beer. They shut the plant down. They buy the, they buy, they only want the brand because they know that they can take that brand, that bottle, that image, that logo, that reputation, that trademark, and put it in their main facilities and produce it at a much faster rate and totally disregard everything else, the community, the jobs, all the impacts. No longer is that a role in the equation. It's a matter of making stockholders happy. And you know, I don't feel good when I give money to those people. and I'm not gonna take money from a guest to give to those big companies that continue to do what they do. It's like, how do you break the cycle? You break the cycle by stop giving these people the money. And I refuse to give the people these money. So on that front, between wine, beer, and spirits, I've created a mecca behind the bar of local, small, handcrafted products from local and from around the world. Next level of it is the non-alcoholic stuff behind the bar. I recently got rid of all Pepsi and Coke products. I haven't had Pepsi in years. Got rid of Coke. There's so many options now for small handcrafted sodas on draft, on the gun, and in bottles. You have stuff like Q-Tonic, which is wild harvested quinine bark from Colombia, sweetened with organic agave nectar. Why would you want to buy cheap corn syrup, uh, synthetic tonic? It just doesn't make sense. You don't have to buy this stuff anymore. The stuff is out there. Rose's lime juice, Rose's grenadine with the corn syrup and all the food dyes, that stuff is in the past. You can use real pomegranate juice now for grenadine. Real fresh pressed, you know, 
good high quality jarred pomegranate juice. It's a no brainer. You can get Marciano cherries now without all that food dye that actually looks like a real cherry instead of something that looks like, you know, a nuclear, nuclear red color. There's so many options. You just have to open up. There's companies out there that now sell fresh, unpasteurized, frozen, and fresh uh, lime juice, lemon juice, orange juice, grapefruit juice that has a shelf life of two, three weeks on it, four weeks. You can freeze the stuff, but it's unpasteurized. And even the stuff that is lightly pasteurized is phenomenal quality. You can buy all these organic juices now. You can walk into a regular grocery store and pick up good high quality organic apple juice, organic pomegranate juice, organic pina colada mix in jars. The, the whole revolution is there and it's changing. And as a restaurant owner, as a bar, you can influence so many people every night. Easily step your game up and easily have an awesome stock bar and not have to worry about supporting any big brands, about buying into that whole stock market you know, cycle of we're there just to please the stockholders. No, you need to buy from companies that are there to make jobs, create jobs, support a community, and feel good about what they're doing. That's what it's about, and that's what my business is about, and those are the products, those are the people that I'm gonna buy from. So, you know, people say I have the best stocked bar. You know, I honestly think I have one of the best stocked bars. In fact, I'm so confident that I have the best stocked bar in the Hudson, in the Hudson Valley, where, where we're from, which is eight counties. I went out and bought the domain name, Hudson Valley's Best Stocked Bar .com. So I urge you to follow, do the same thing, and in your community, in your state, whatever, buy that domain name, whatever it is. Napa Valley's Best Stocked Bar .com, Oregon's Top Bar .com, Oregon's Best Stocked Bar .com, whatever, wherever you are, whatever you are, really take pride in what you do. And, and emphasize it and show it off and tell your customers, you have to educate your guests, you have to educate your staff. And you know, I have people that won't drink anything anywhere else because they know the amount of time I've taken to put into my bar. You don't need an extensive, I wanna really focus on this, you don't need an extensive selection. You don't need an extensive selection, you need a high quality, hand-picked selection that you personally endorse because of their business practices, their morals, their ethics, uh, and just because you're having a relationship. Because you, you can have a relationship. You can't have a relationship with a publicly traded company besides buying a stock and getting you know information from them in the mail. You can have a relationship by supporting an independent tequila producer, by supporting an independent cognac producer, by supporting an, in supporting an independent champagne producer, by supporting the local brewery, the local distillery, that's how you build relationships, and that's what it's about. And people nowadays, you know, people are really attaching themselves. That's why social media is so big, because there's relationships involved. Love doing it, and I just love sharing ideas like this. Um, if you're a restaurant owner and you need help with a bar, please reach out to me. Email me at help at 50mistakes.com. I'm happy to help with stuff like this. This is my passion, and I'm happy to promote handcrafted artisanal booze. Just very happy to promote it. I'm Marcus Giuliano. Thanks for watching.